And again, we are in the book of the Revelation, studying the new heavens and the new earth. But what we did is there was um, several questions because uh, a lot of what we're covering with the Millennial Temple is in Ezekiel, which uh, also contains sacrifices, priesthood, things of that nature, which we thought were, which most people would think are done away with. Um, people were asking about the relationship of those things to uh, people in the kingdom that got us back into Ezekiel, and primarily uh, the relationship of those sacrificial offerings. And so what we did is we started looking at this outline, uh, which is the book of Ezekiel, I try to try to help you out, stair step you up to see the relationship between these millennial sacrifices in regards to Christ's once for all final sacrifice for sin and for salvation. So we were looking at the perspective of uh, this, some people's viewpoints on when this temple actually uh, exists historically in redemptive history. Some say it's not uh, a temple at all, it's just an allegory for the church. Some say it was the Solomons or Zerubbabel's, which was built up by Herod in the past, and then two viewpoints. One is that, of course, it represents uh, the future eternal state, which uh, all of the details uh, of the temple, plus what's going on in during that time period of the Millennial Kingdom, uh, isn't isn't true of the eternal state. So uh, I come to the conclusion that it is a literal future messianic temple. And then we were looking at uh, the peoples. And I, I want to kind of back up just a minute because we are talking about relationships and we are going to talk again about relationships. But I wanted to give you a sort of a visual of this, try to maybe help you so it'll sort of solidify what we're looking at in your minds. Now, having said that, I want to remind you of something. This goes against a uniformity, right? Uniformity says things have always been uh, as they are and they'll always continue to be and that's how the unregenerate view history. Remember Peter talks about that. People who are disputing the return of Christ. Well, where is the return of Christ? You know, everything's just like it always was since the early time. Things never are going to change. But actually, if you think about it biblically, world history from a biblical perspective, which is the truth, right? I mean, I hope that's how you see things as a Christian. You have a biblical worldview of things. If you have that biblical worldview of things, then what you will see is we have actually lived in or will eventually have lived in actually five ecosystems. Think about it. The garden had its own context and ecosystem. It was basically a big terrarium. Remember, it didn't rain. It was evaporation, condensation. God watered the uh, earth through the midst of the ground, right? That's totally different from our system today, isn't it? Totally different, right? Then you have after the, the fall. Everything now is cursed. Adam has to work by the sweat of his brow, right? There's thorns and thistles, and you can see evidences of the fall, but we don't live in that system either because there was something else that happened, right? The flood. And the flood changed everything. It changed the whole topography. It changed the whole environment, right? Now animals are wild. Now they're carnivorous. Before they were herbivores, right? Every, everyone was and everything was. But not now. Now they're carniv carnivores. Well, we live in that kind of system now, that post-flood system. But there's going to come a day that there's going to be a messianic kingdom. Remember, during the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period, there's going to be furious judgments throughout that seven-year period in which the whole topography of the earth is going to change. Earthquakes, hailstorms of 100 pounds each, uh, all kinds of uh, topog uh, topographical and climactic changes are going to occur during that time period. When you get into the Messianic kingdom, let me just give you a reference so that you can understand this. Look at uh, Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. Let me show you just one of the many topographical changes and things that are going to take place. 
Zechariah chapter 14, and you might want to uh, mark that because we'll come back to that. And let me read just down through the several of these verses starting in verse 1 so you see the context and what time period we're talking about. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Whenever we read the Bible, we need to understand that every verse has a context itself. It's either in the past, the present, or the future. And you can't divorce the meaning of that verse from that setting, that context, okay? So let's look at chapter 14 and verse 1. Behold, a day is coming for Yahweh, for the Lord, when the spoil would be taken from, from the, when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Has that happened? All nations have come against them at once? Not yet. So it's future. The city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. That's an expression we're going to look at as well. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east, and on the Mount of Olives, and he will split it in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. And you will flee by the valley of, of my mountains for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azale. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him. So you see in the context, it's the return of Christ. Remember, the disciples were on the Mount of Olives. They were looking up when he was ascending. Angel said, why are you looking for him? He's going to come the same way he left. He's coming, he left up off the Mount of Olives. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. Here is that happening or being prophesied. And it will come about in that day that there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And it will come about in that day that living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, or the salt sea, or the dead sea, and the other half toward the western sea. And it will be in summer as well as winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. You'll see in Isaiah that he says the deserts will bloom as a, blo as a blossom, right? The, the valley that's going to be cut from the Mediterranean Sea on the west, the Great Sea, will cut, be cut in, and link up to the Dead Sea to where it'll be life-giving again. That's a topographical change. That's not taking place yet. That will take place, though. If you take that literally, which there's no reason not to. So I just wanted you to see that in the Messianic kingdom, there's going to be topographical changes. There's going to be all sorts of changes, right? And then, of course, there is the eternal state. And that eternal state will be much different. Again, remember, there's no sea. There's no, uh, there's no light. There's no moon. There's no luminaries. There's no temple. None of that, right? And we've studied that. So I just want you to understand that. Because that will play a big part in how you view what we're going to be looking at. And it'll, it'll help you to understand. Now, last time we talked about the peoples. That's point two, right? The resurrections. Now, I know you might have a different uh, system of resurrections, but just so you can process this and get this in your thinking. Christ is said to be the first fruits of those who have risen not to die again. 1 Corinthians 15, 23, right? You can look at that. He says, when he comes... He will raise all in their own order, all of his in their own order, their own troop. I believe that's a, when the harpazo happens, the rapture of the saints. There will be the gleanings that we read about and read about in Revelation 20, verses 4 and 6, of those tribulation saints, and I believe the Old Testament saints, right? And then a thousand years later, there will be another resurrection of the dead, those out of hell who will stand at the great white throne, right? You remember that? Okay. Now, so let me share this with you, and this will maybe help you to think, think about this. So here is the millennial kingdom. This is who is in the millennial kingdom then. Resurrected Old Testament saints, 
Resurrected church saints, resurrected tribulation saints, right? Now just with those top three, remember when we studied what is yet to come as far as our salvation? Our glorification. Remember that? That means you will be in a glorified body. That means you will not sin again. Right? There will be no flesh to contest. You will be perfect. You will not fight against the fallen remnants of sin anymore. So you have in this messianic kingdom those three groups who will be in their glorified bodies. And we studied that, remember? I hope you remember, right? If you don't, you can go back and look at your outline. In addition to that, you have righteous saints in their mortal bodies who when Christ comes, go into the kingdom. Remember, remember that? Matthew chapter 24. He talks about them. They're blessed. They're the righteous. They're the sheep. They go into the kingdom. Or Matthew 25, right? That kingdom will last a thousand years. Because it will last a thousand years, those people who have entered the kingdom in their mortal bodies will have children. That's where those rebels will come from. So when Ezekiel is talking about a literal temple and little Jerusalem and everything is holy, these are the people who will be there. Now questions or thoughts so far? Are you processing it? Do you already know all this? Give me some feedback. Yeah, Bill. Do you think that the resurrected group will... How much are they going to ask this? Will they, will they recall the... Being that I'm assuming that this is meaning saints in their natural body will have to go through the reproduction process. Will the resurrected ones that obviously I'm assuming won't be No. Through, yep. Will they remember that whole process and will you be jealous or something? Well you'll be perfect. You think you'll be jealous? <laughs> no. There will be marriage in that state, but it's it'll be the marriage of the bride to Christ. You'll be perfectly satisfied. You'll be, see, right, again, this is, this is a good point Bill's bringing up. You know, how will you think? What will you remember? What will you desire? This is a, a time period that we've never experienced. And all we can do is know what the scripture says, and then we have to just anticipate it, right? But if you take it literally and normally, which there's no reason not to, you'll be in that confirmed state of righteousness if you died in Christ. Revelation 22, uh, I think verse 11, or let me just make sure of that. I don't want to give you the wrong reference. It talks about whoever dies righteous, let him be righteous still, and whoever is uh, uh, unrighteous, let him be righteous still. It's in Revelation 22. And I was thinking... Yeah, verse 11. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy be filthy. Let the one who is righteous practice righteousness. And let the one who is holy uh, still keep himself holy. You'll be confirmed in whatever state you die. That's why the rich man and Lazarus, when the rich man is in hell, he doesn't change. Hell didn't change him. Hell doesn't change anybody. Look at the tribulation judgments. It doesn't change anybody. When God is, when they acknowledge those judgments are coming from God, bam, 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 bam. What does it say? They repented? No, it says they repented not of their evil deeds, but they cursed God. They knew those judgments were from God, and it didn't lead them to repentance. A resurrected person won't lead you to repentance. Right? Lazarus is raised from the dead. What did they say? We've got to kill him again. Jesus raised us from the dead. Did that change him? It didn't change him. These are tests. And, I, and I'm, the reason I'm saying this is because during this millennial kingdom time, this is a test for these people who go into this kingdom. Remember the characteristics of this millennial kingdom. Perfect peace, perfect righteousness, no sin, no Satan, no disease, no death. They don't know what death is. It's a rare thing. You see? Yes? Yes? It's 
good. Don't lose it. And Randy's talking about, you know, now, before when we were younger and immature, we had things like tricycles, and then when he got older and matured, he got a bike, he never looked back on the tricycle, he has a car, he doesn't look back on the tricycle because if he matured, it's going to be that same way for us now. There are things now that when we get on in the eternal state, well, when we get in the millennial kingdom, we'll look back. There's no looking back. Why? Well, those things were great, but we have Christ now. Perfect peace, perfect righteousness. We're confirmed in righteousness. And as good as that time will be, we have only eternity to look forward to. Yeah. That's great. That's a great analogy. Yeah. What, what, yeah. Randy's pointing out that it's likened to, you know, a little child when they, instead of giving give them a, a bike or a hoppity horse, you give them a car. They, what is that? To them, they can't conceive of it. It's like us trying to wrap our mind around the eternal state. Dan? I was just going to add to what he was saying is, if anything, I would think that those people here on earth who are not glorified would be jealous of what we have because of being perfect. Well, remember, they're battling their sin nature. Yep. So, and one of the things, one of the, well, I don't want to get off on that. So, let me just, uh, let me try to get through this here. Concerning the peoples, remember, God has a purpose and a program. Now, some people who teach that, you know, the Jews crucified their Messiah, so God did away with them. That's not scriptural. And I could give you other scriptures, but look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 37. It's up here on the overhead. This is what the sovereign Lord, Yahweh, says. If the heavens above can be measured, the foundations of the earth searched out, searched out below, then I will also reject all of the sins of Israel for everything they have done. See that? Plus, how did God choose Israel? Because he foresaw their works on the basis of his grace, right? His sovereign choice. So what? Did it change now? All of a sudden it's of works? No, it never changed, right? Okay. I'm trying to step you up to where we want to be, but I, I, I want you to get a handle on this because it's so hard to get a handle on something we've never experienced, right? And so, in the Messianic kingdom, you have those ruling under Messiah's reign, right? We were promised to reign. 2 Timothy 2, uh, 12, I think it is. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 6. They'll reign with him. They'll reign with him. They'll reign with him, right? Well, who? Well, the church will reign. The Bible says that, that we'll judge angels. Now, what's that mean? I don't know. But that's what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. No, you're not. You'll judge angels. You'll judge the world. You have a part in that rulership with Christ. And it will be perfect because what condition will you be in? Perfect condition. You see that? All right, you'll get there. The apostles were promised to sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, I thought everybody was perfect. No, remember, there's a, there's a group of people that are not perfect that are in there. So the disciples will be judging. The Zadokian priesthood will be judging. And they say, what is that about? Remember in Ezekiel what we're talking about. There's a priesthood, and it's the line of Zadok. Now, not without going into a bunch of details, Aaron had several sons. Two died because of offering strange fire in uh, Leviticus 10. Then he had uh, two other sons, uh, Ithamar and Eleazar. Ithamar's line went down to Eli. Remember, Eli had two sons who were wicked. They were wicked, and God said in 1 Samuel chapter 2, let's read that because that's going to, that's going to use a phrase that we're going to need to know. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Hopefully Megan didn't take it out of my Bible this morning, so I can find it here. 1 Samuel, look at chapter 2, and I think beginning in verse 31. Let me do 29. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me? Now, this is the charge to Eli. God said, you're not 
confronting your son's open sin and you're putting them above me. You can find your own application in that one, right? I'm moving on. By taking yourself the fat of the choices of every offering of my people. This is how they were doing it. The fat belonged to the Lord. Amen. Lord love fat. I don't know. He loves me, I guess. Therefore the Lord God of Israel declares, I, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now the sovereign Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and your strength, the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. And you will see the distress of my dwelling. In spite of all that I do good for Israel, an old man will not be in your house forever. Yet I will not, and here's the phrase, cut off every man of yours from my altar that your eyes may fill from weeping and your soul grieve. And all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. And this will be the sign to which you shall come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day, both of them shall die. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and my soul. And I will build him an enduring house and he will walk before my anointed always. Eliezer had another son, you can read about, by the name of Phinehas. The children of Israel in the book of Numbers were getting, yoking up with the Moabite women. You remember that story? So much so that they were blatantly sinning right in front of the tabernacle. An Israelite man took a Moabite woman and was expressing his feelings for her right out in the open. And the Bible says, because of the zeal of Phineas, he, he ran at them and stuck them to the ground. And God, in the book of Numbers, said, because of the zeal of Phineas' house, he, from his line, he will have an enduring priesthood. And we'll look at those verses, and you'll see who is in his line. And, of course, that line um, leads to Zadok. That's why you have a Zadokian priesthood. So, Zadok, look at Numbers chapter 25, and let's just go through those couple of those. So again, I just want you to really understand uh, why things are happening the way that they're happening in the millennial kingdom because of things that happened way back when. And I'm going to show you a word that has to do with that. And some of you will love this word because I know you do, right? Starts with a C and ends of, anyway, with an oven in. So look at Numbers. <laughs> Numbers 25 verses 12 and 13. Numbers 25, verses 12 and 13. Therefore say, Behold, I give him my counsel of peace, and it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of perpetual priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and he made atonement for the sons of Israel. See that? And then you can look at those other references uh, another time. Jeremiah 33 says that that covenant will not cease. Neither will the Davidic dynasty of David ruling, Jeremiah 33, verses 19 to 22. And we see that then in the future, coming to pass in Ezekiel 45 and 46, when there's a priesthood of Zadok, and they're ministering to the Lord, and the Lord is pleased there. So you say, well, you mentioned uh, not only that, well, David, you have verses there that confirm David, of course, again, he's going to be resurrected like everyone else, David will have a part in ruling as well. And all these passages confirm that. Jeremiah 30, verse 9, Ezekiel 34, 23, 37, 24, and Hosea 3, 5, all specifically say, not a son of David, but David will rule. See that? Now, since I take it literal, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, if the church is going to be ruling and reigning, if the, if, uh, the disciples are, are going to be ruling and reigning, if there's going to be a perpetual priesthood, ruling under Christ, why would you have a problem with David, right? I don't have a problem with that, but, all right, any thoughts so far before I give you this one? All right, so now there's a term that uh, some translations, I'm not sure what your translation reads, but anytime you see the phrase, God made a covenant with someone, or he made a covenant, 
uh, in the Legacy Standard Bible, which is an updated NASB, it, it has the term God cut a covenant. Because that's the word, to cut. That's the meaning of covenant. It means to cut, right? And you know the, the story of how that is, the symbolic uh, or the, uh, uh, the, the a, a literal, uh, what's the word, ceremonial picture of that is in Genesis 15 with the cutting of the pieces, right? So here's some of the covenants of the Bible. The Noahic covenant, of course you know that, right? And the, the sign of the covenant is what? The rainbow, right? Okay, your priestly covenant or the covenant of peace, which is, again, why you'll have a priesthood during Messiah's reign. And it'll be of the house of Zadok, just like was promised. You have the Abrahamic covenant, which is that sort of umbrella covenant where all the other promises are given, land, seed, and blessing come from Abraham. That's what he was promised in Genesis 10. That was confirmed in 15 and ratified is the word I was looking for. Uh when he cut those pieces in half. Then you have the bilateral or conditional covenant, Mosaic covenant. This is where everybody gets confused, so listen. The Mosaic covenant did not replace the Abrahamic covenant. Galatians is clear on this. The covenant given to Abraham was given 400 years early on promise. God promised Abraham. So 400 years later, the Mosaic law is given. That didn't replace the, prominent, the, the promised covenant of land, seed, and blessing. What it did was, and if you'll read the covenant language there in Deuteronomy 28 and, uh, or 26 and uh, Leviticus 26 and the, the Ten Commandments, the stipulations there, the enjoyment of that land was conditional. Remember at the end of Leviticus 26, he said, if you don't do these things, starting in verse 15, you're, I'm going to curse your seed, I'm going to curse your land, and then I'm going to kick you off of the land and kick you out. But there's always the promise, even in that land promise of Deuteronomy 30, that he's going to bring them back in the end, restore them, regenerate them, reestablish them, and reassert them as the head of the nations. Right? Now I realize you, how many of you know everything I'm telling you right now? And I'm kind of boring you. Okay, I'm just I'm trying to trying to sort of gauge you right here. I'm just bringing you up to speed. That is the only one that's conditional. Then you have the land covenant found in Deuteronomy and in uh, that 15th chapter of Genesis, and of course the new covenant, which is that covenant of blessing, where God in Galatians three says that new covenant is the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which we get right because of our faith in Christ. So we're participants of that. The Davidic covenant, which is David will have a descendant who will reign on the throne of David from Jerusalem. That's Christ, right? Davidic covenant. Now those are clear covenants that are explicitly mentioned in Scripture. There are two covenants that, not, that are not explicitly mentioned in Scripture, but that are heavily implied. And that's probably the two that most of you are familiar with. And that's the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. But even Lewis Burkhoff and Hodge and their commentaries will tell you, and they're all millennials, uh, uh, or in historic pre, uh, those covenants are not explicitly mentioned in the scripture, but they are implied. And that is the covenant of works. God makes a covenant with Abraham. Hosea 6 verse 7 talks about this, how that uh, Israel, like Adam, had reneged on their covenant. God said, you're in, the, you're in the ground, I'm establishing you, this is my, this is my um, and the, here's the pattern. This is what God is eventually, has been doing. God is the administrator, right? He puts man and his wife in the garden, says, now you, you have exercised dominion over it for me on my behalf. You're my vassal regents, right? So you have that theocratic administration, God over man and woman who's over creation. So there's stipulations. Adam has to do certain things, right? He has to till the ground, or he has to uh, um, do the work that God has given him to do and avoid eating the tree, right? And, of course, he falls. So there has to be another Adam, a second Adam, 1 Corinthians talks about, who will represent a new humanity, right? Who will keep all of God's law, which is, of course, Jesus. This is what is called the covenant of grace, and you see it first in that Genesis 3.15 verse, where there, there's a promised seed that will crush the serpent's head, right? 
Isaiah, uh, I think it's 42, I don't know, yeah, Isaiah 42, 6 and 49, 8, you can write those down. Christ, or the Messiah, is said to be God's covenant. Okay? And then, of course, in the book of Hebrews, he's called the guarantor of the covenant, the mediator of the covenant, and that's uh, com- what's commonly known as uh, the covenant of grace, right? Any thoughts so far before we get to where we're at right now? Yeah, the Shannon. That's a good question. So um, let me try to rephrase it. Say the first part of it again. Was it a corporate responsibility and accountability? And Can we say it like that? Applied and it's applied to the whole and not just the one. You're exactly right, and we're going to cover that. Right? You're exactly right, and, and we're going to cover that. So let's look at the problems. That's number two on your, uh, or three, or four, I'm not sure. I, re- I, I have to stay away from my notes because I rewrite them. I'll go home and I'll say, man, I didn't say that right. And so I apologize for that. So let's look at the problem here. Christ's sacrifice. Here's the problem people have with sacrifices in, in this millennial kingdom. What about Christ's once for all sacrifice? Right? So look at those passages I've given you. Hebrews chapter 10. And not that we have to mention these, but we will. Because Christ died once for all, right? He says once for all sacrifice for, for sin. Right? For sin. Hebrews chapter 10. For the law, since it's only a shadow of the good things to come and not the uh, very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices, which were animal sacrifices, year by year, which they uh, offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they wouldn't have kept offering them, obviously, right? Verse 3, but those sacrifices, in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of the sins year by year. Look down to verses 10 through 12 for time's sake. Uh, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering uh, offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Right? Verse 11. For every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Underline that too. But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time set down at the right hand of God. So in light of that, many other passages that you already know about, Acts 4.12, neither is there uh, salvation in any other, no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Uh, you know, Romans 3.25, Hebrews 9.15, you could go on and on. Uh, it pleased God to crush the Messiah, Isaiah 53.10. In light of that, how can there be animal sacrifices? Because Christ already died once for sin. The other question somebody might ask is, isn't that like going back to the types and shadows? I mean, aren't aren't you suggesting that you're going back to the types and shadows? Well, if you mean by that going back under the Mosaic Law, then no, because this isn't the Mosaic time period. It's the Messianic time period, which is the Millennial time period, which is past the Tribulational time period, which is past this time period. You see what I'm saying? You have to understand the setting, the context of what you're reading there. So, let's ask this then. Ezekiel chapter 45. Turn there. Ezekiel 45. We finally got to Ezekiel again. Look at Ezekiel 45. I'm going to try to not rush, but rush. So, Isaiah chapter 45. Now, somebody's going to ask, and you should ask, well, what, is, what are we told about Ezekiel's sacrifices? What, are we, what does Ezekiel tell us that these sacrifices are for? Right? And this is... There are views, but here we're explicitly told. Verse 15, one sheep from each flock, 200 from watering places of Israel, for a grain offering, for a burn offering, for a peace offering, to make atonement for them, declares the Lord. The them is Israel. To make atonement for them. Oh, that's problematic. Maybe. But you have to study. Right? Right? Look at verse 17. Verse 17 again. And it shall be the prince's part to provide the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, the drink offerings at the feasts. 
So they have feasts again, the new moons, and on the Sabbaths, and that's plural because their holidays were Sabbath days, and all the appointed feasts of the house of Israel. He shall provide the sin offering, grain offering, burnt offering, the peace offerings, to make atonement for the house of Israel. Again, we're told, it's to make atonement for the house of Israel. They have to do something with that, right? Verse 20, And you shall do on the seventh day of the month, for every one who goes astray or is naive, so shall you make atonement for the house. So Ezekiel says it's to make atonement. Now this word atonement, it's used all throughout Leviticus. It's the same word. It's used in uh, chapter 16 of the Day of Atonement, verse 24. Uh, It's said to forgive or cover sins. And that's what the word kafar means, to cover, literally or or figuratively to expiate or to take away or to to placate. The The first time it's used is in the ark, right? Genesis 6, 14, they covered it with pitch. It means to cover. So that's what atonement means. So what we need to look at then is what does the Bible say that the Old Testament sacrifices were for? Right? Ezekiel says those millennial ones will be to cover sin. And this is going to tie in with your question of national responsibility, right? So if you look at just a couple verses, because, uh, well, for time's sake, let's just look at one, but you can look through Leviticus. Leviticus 4, verse 20, and then verse 26, verse 31 to 4. Just look at that fourth chapter, and it'll give you cross references in Leviticus. But let me read uh, Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15, for time's sake, verses 25 and 26. And primarily, I want you to listen to verse 26 here. Numbers 15, verses 25 and 26. Then the priest shall make atonement, and here it is, for all the congregation of the sons of Israel. They shall be forgiven. Wow. He makes it for all the congregation and they're forgiven. For it was an error, and they have brought their offering, an offering by fire to the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their error. So it's for forgiveness. But in what sense? Are we talking about salvation forgiveness? Or is there another type of forgiveness that there could be? What are your thoughts? Or you want me to just go on? Now, here's how some people reconcile this. They say, well, the Old Testament saints saw these sacrifices as pointing to God's sacrifice of Christ. And based on that, uh, they were forgiven for their sins. I don't really, I find that really problematic. Listen to Peter's description of those people in that time period. They were trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Messiah and the glories that would follow. They were trying to figure those things out. They knew God had a Messiah, Daniel chapter 9, and he was going to come, but exactly what was going to happen after that, what they were limited to was Messiah would come and set up the kingdom. Right? That's what they knew. That's what they were anticipating. Listen to what Paul calls... Paul says about this. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God has now proclaimed to mankind that all people everywhere should repent. Now, you would think, even under the Old Testament economy, because remember, the disciples are still under the Old Testament economy. You would think if anybody knew the gospel, the disciples got it, right? I mean, they're the closest to the Messiah. Even even in John 1, I think it's Nathaniel goes and says, haven't we found the one Moses talked about, the Messiah? Right? So you would think they got it. But in Mark chapter 9, verses 31 and 2, Jesus was teaching his disciples, telling them the Son of Man is going to be handed over to men. They'll kill him, and when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. And they said, hallelujah, go to the cross. Because that's the gospel of our personal salvation. Now, I'm not trying to be irreverent, but I want you to get the point. They had no clue. It did not register to them. Yeah. They were all thinking, all of Israel, including the apostles, it's going to be a kingdom that's going to last forever. Right. Well, they were yes. 
That's why they tried to take him in John 6 and force him to be king. Right? So this is problematic to me. But it still doesn't answer our question. So let me write it up here. This is the type of forgiveness. Uh Uh-oh. You probably ain't going to see it. It was national or theocratic forgiveness. Not salvation. Not for salvation. And that's where our phrase, to cut off, comes in. You remember in Genesis 1, I I already established it, God set man and, and his wife in the garden to rule creation for God. That's the kingdom. They lose it. It's usurped by Satan. Now they're not exercising dominion. So then God calls out the children of Israel, and in a little microcosm, uh, Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, he calls them out to be a what? A kingdom of priests for him. Now it's a miniature. He's going to start dealing with one nation to be what was lost in the fall, right? So what happened to those who sinned under that theocracy? Look at Genesis 17, verse 14, and this is... This is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. So if you don't keep the Abrahamic covenant sign as, a, as uh, they were to do, there was something that would happen. Verse 14. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. Cut off. What does that mean? They excommunicate him? Well, look at, Dan- look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Uh, or just listen, and I'll give you, and you can tell me what this means then. And you know this passage. We looked at Daniel several times before. It's talking about Messiah, and it's talking about when he comes, and uh, after he comes, uh, and then presents himself uh, to the nation, what happens to him. And so in Daniel chapter 9, the same phrase you'll see is used, and then you can tell me what you think... Uh, What do you think it means? Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. What does that mean? Die. It means he would be killed. On the Sabbath day, under the old economy, in Exodus 12 and verse 15, what was done if you were found working on the Sabbath? You were killed. Right? You're cut off from your people. And that's the same thing that was used. It was for theocratic forgiveness. That's what it atoned for. It atoned, it covered that sin so that the congregation wasn't judged. Right? So those who sinned against theocracy, the theocracy sinned against the theocratic administrator who was God. So to sin against under Moses had a severe consequence because you were sinning against the community, bringing judgment on the community, and sinning against the lawgiver. So those sins that were made, uh, those atonements that were made, were made for that theocratic forgiveness. Now there's another reason, but uh, just for that one, that one for right now, I want you to try to get, get a hold of. Remember, in the tabernacle was the presence of Yahweh. In Solomon's temple, the presence of Yahweh. But during Solomon's time, that temple, you recall, was during Ezekiel's day, right? They had sinned nationally. Northern Israel got taken away into captivity. Judah's left. Judah's headed the same direction. God said, I'm raising up uh, uh, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to be my rod of correction because you guys are sinning. Now, not all of them were, but enough of them were that corporately they were going to be punished. And they were punished, right? They were exiled into into Babylonian captivity, right? Then when they come back, Zerubbabel builds a temple. Years later, Herod, to try to get in good with the Jews, he was half Jew, uh, how do you say, Adunium, uh, builds the temple up. But what's missing from Zerubbabel in that temple? What's missing? The presence of God, Right? And that's why now, during this time, you have what we talked about before, and I don't think I brought it, or maybe I did. You have that sort of three interim 
temples talked about, where the Lord's body is the temple, where you individually are God's temple, where the church, the true church, those who are born again, are the temple, right? Now, some of you might be asking, well, how are they saved then in the Old Testament? Because that's a question, right? How are they saved then? The basis of salvation in every age is always the death of Christ. The, the perfect life he lived, the death that he died to propitiate sin, right? You find that in Romans 3.25, Hebrews 9.15. He died for the sins that were formerly committed uh, that God didn't judge immediately, right? So the basis is always salvation. There are not two works of salvation, two schemes of salvation, right? So the basis is always, in every age, the death of Christ. The requirement in every age is faith. You have to have faith. You have to believe, right? The object of that faith in every age is God, but the content of that faith changes. That's why I say, that's why we're told they didn't understand. They understood some things. They understood that there was a promised seed to come. They understood that God had a Messiah that was going to come through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah, through the house of David, down through that, and he was going to be a political deliverer. But as far as dying, the disciples even, who were closest to Jesus, rebuked him for that when he said, I've got to die. They didn't understand that. You see that? But they were saved on the merits of what Christ would do, but the content of what they understood was different. So it doesn't affect the means of, the basis of salvation. You just have to, if you don't do it that way, I don't understand how, how else, let me ask you, how else could you understand that they were saved? Because you, you couldn't be saved by the animal sacrifices, but it says they were forgiven. Yeah, theocratically they were forgiven, they were covered. Because the, because the content of what they were told was, you offer the sacrifice. And God will pass over you. Remember the Passover? You apply the blood, God's judgment passes over. That's what they knew. That's what they did. Right? It's the last point, of course, that distinguishes dispensationalism from covenant theology. This is a quote by Charles Ryrie. In other words, most covenant people, that's why you will hear, you will, and I'm, I'm trying to be really nice and reverent, and I mean this in the nicest way. You will find uh, covenant people will preach Jesus in the Old Testament constantly and disregard the historicity of that section and an application because they have a redemptive lens through which they look. So everything is going to mean Christ. We're looking for Christ in the Old Testament. Now, there are places where Christ is seen and shadowed, foreshadowed and typified. But not every place in the Old Testament it has as its end meaning Jesus and redemption. That's the distinguishing feature. Yeah, the shame. According to Charles Ryrie. And he, yeah, in Luke 24, 27, and verse 44, but he, if you will read that correctly and clearly, he says he brought out all the things concerning himself. He didn't say everything in the Old Testament is about me. I thought it was meaning that he was showing how all of it concerned himself. No, he would say the promised seed, that was me. Right? The Levitical offerings, the Day of Atonement. Right? The scapegoat. So also then when we're talking about the, the corporate or national forgiveness and, and judgment, how then they also have individual grace, just like you have the Davidic covenant. So David found, you know, and you have like Phineas found, you know what I'm saying? Like where is that right that God made exceptions to some of that? It was everything he did that he accepted was by grace, right? But I mean, there was some individual in there, right? With, like, Who found grace in the eyes of the Lord like Noah said to, like Enoch said to, and others? Yeah. Sure. There's grace in every... The, the fact that anybody lives beyond a moment of their breath is grace, right?
And that's where you get the dispensational thinking. There's epochs of time. There's periods of time. And all of you understand this, right? This is what we were talking about at the very start. But if you've not been taught it enough, and that's not the lens that you look through, you're not looking for a historical context. You're, You're looking for a redemptive application. And that only. And I don't think that that honors the Lord. Luke, did you have something? I wanted to get people who don't usually say anything. I figured I'd get somebody stirred up from the back row eventually. It took me the whole class time, but. Yeah, yeah. The, que- the question is, am I saying that not every verse in the Old Testament is about Jesus and his redemptive purpose? And yes, that's what I'm saying, right? I can give you a bunch of obscure passages and read them, and, and you won't find, yeah, at all, yeah. I think so. God covered them. Um, I think he provided for them after their fall. Uh, and I think in that way that that, Obviously, if he cut her from the animal skin, somebody killed the animal. I don't know who did that part of it, but there's blood shed, which typified. But the basis, if they were, the basis, again, is the future finished work of Christ. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, and what gets confusing, he said Abraham's a good example of that, uh, in that Abraham believed what God had revealed to him, which in Genesis 15, where it says he believed God and it was kind of for righteousness, was concerning the land, right? How do I know you're going to give me this land? Well, we're going to cut a covenant. That's how you know. And I'm obliging myself to fulfill the requirements of this covenant. And Abraham believed that, and God counted it to him for righteousness, Right? You have to think this thing, I realize this may be a little bit difficult, and you have to think it through if you've not been exposed to it, and if you've not thought about it, but I think if you'll just consider that there are different time periods in which God administers his, his program, you'll see that very clearly. Again, you don't live in the time of innocence. You don't live under the Mosaic law. You don't live under the Masonic, Messianic uh, law which we'll see that in the future. There is a law that will govern the Messianic kingdom. That's why he rules with a rod of iron. That's why people are judged for not keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why there is death, even though it's scarce, Isaiah 65, 20, in the Millennial Kingdom. Okay? Any closing thoughts? Deshannon, you don't have to shy from it. If I don't know it, I'll just tell you I don't know. I think you're working out a question, but I don't hear a question. So uh, that's all right, though. I mean, that's, this is what this Bible study. You, then that's what happens. When you start thinking those things through that you never thought, you know, through, I walk around my house all the time talking out loud. Nobody's there. Nobody responds. Right? So it's okay. Do you have a question, though, that goes with that, a concise question? So what, what people? The people reading or the people who wrote the Bible? The people living in that time. Like Israel did not understand. They, well, again, they understood there was a promised seed to come. They understood there was a Messiah to come. But it was that, that, again, goes back to what we're saying. The content of what they understood was obviously not what you understand. And there's things in the millennial kingdom that they'll understand that you won't. How many of you can fathom living in a perfect world 
of peace and righteousness where everyone does right, where evolution is not taught, there's not abortion, there's not gay pride uh, parades, none of that, and you're dwelling in the midst of all glorified saints, but there are people walking around who in their heart are rebellious. Now what do you think they feel like? Right? Can you, can you understand that kind of a context? I can. But that's the context of the Messianic kingdom. 